Hi, my name is Eleanor Tatum, and I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of the New York Amsterdam News. The coronavirus crisis has brought serious distress to local economies and advertising along with them. The New York Amsterdam News has partnered with the local media association during this unprecedented crisis. Help us continue our important work in chronicling the life of black New Yorkers and consider making a donation to the COVID-19 local news fund today. Go to givebutter.com slash Amsterdam News. Again, that is G-I-V-E-B-U-T-T-E-R dot com slash Amsterdam News. Thank you and stay safe. It's Thursday, June 25th, and welcome to the New York Amsterdam News Podcast. I'm Cyril Josh Barker. On this week's episode, my guest is activist Reverend Kevin McCall. He's going to be speaking with me about the recent police killings of black Americans and his assistance to the family of George Floyd. He's also going to discuss the recent protests taking place across the nation and America's reckoning with race relations. And that was Reverend Kevin McCall at a recent press conference where he called for the arrest of an NYPD officer who was suspended without pay after he was caught on video using a now banned chokehold on a citizen during an arrest in Queens. Reverend McCall has been helping the family of Minneapolis police killing victim George Floyd and has been particularly close to Floyd's brother Terrence who lives in Brooklyn. On June 4th, Reverend McCall organized a public memorial service for Floyd at Cadman Plaza in Brooklyn that brought out 10,000 people. And we welcome you to this episode of our podcast. And I'm very happy to have Reverend Kevin McCall with me this week on this episode. Uh, I've known him for many years and seen his activism, and he's done such a wonderful job. You know, he's been on the front lines of the George Floyd case, and he's been very helpful to the family. Um, he's also going to be giving us an update on what's going on with the George Floyd family Uh in the aftermath of everything that's going on with the protest, you know, I've noticed that there's been a little bit less coverage uh, on the situation. And I, I think that, you know, him being on here definitely is needed to, to give us an update on how the family's doing. And I'd like to know his thoughts on everything that's going on in the country. Well, it is Thursday and the paper did come out today and I have several stories that I want to go over with you. Our front page story uh, this week is about New York City entering phase two as the recovery from COVID-19 continues. We speak to two well-known black business owners in Harlem about what they're experiencing as they reopen their doors. Also, we have a roundup of the recent primary elections. There were several big winners in key races, including Jamal Bowman and City Council Member Richie Torres, who both won their congressional primaries, and City Council Member Donovan Richards, who was poised to be the next Queensboro president. And in our arts and entertainment section, we have an overview of the upcoming International Arts Festival, that, I'm sorry, International African Arts Festival. Uh, we're going to get dig into some details about how the event is going to go this year. I'm sure you understand that things are going to go a little bit differently due to the COVID-19 pandemic. You can check out all these stories and more by picking up the paper. All we ask is that you do it safely uh, on newsstands, or you can go online to AmsterdamNews.com to read these stories and more. And I have to announce that the Amsterdam News is proud, proud, proud to announce that we are one of 24 news newsrooms recently awarded a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation for, for Technology and Website Enhancements. Our publication was chosen out of dozens of other news organizations to receive the grant, and we're going to use the grant to make some changes to our website and tell stories using multimedia tools, and we're so happy about that. And we're looking forward to serving you in a more expanded capacity, and a big, big thank you to the Knight Foundation for that grant. Well, my guest this week is activist Kevin McCall, who is going to talk with me about his work on the George Floyd case and social justice activism. Welcome to the podcast, Reverend McCall. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, thank you for coming. Well, I've known you for many, many years, and I've seen your activism. Uh, we've been seeing you a lot lately on the national news, uh, you know, working with the family of George Floyd and also with his brother Terrence. Um, first and foremost, let me just say, I think for me, the, the kind of... Uh, 
the that nail that hit the head for me. I'm, I was already upset about the situation, but when we saw Terrence Floyd scream when he went to the site of where his brother was killed was so impactful. Um, tell us what's going on with the family. How are they doing? How's Terrence doing? Well, they're holding up. You know, they have been through a trying time from beginning uh, from what transpired uh, with their loved one, uh, and they have been holding up. Uh, they just want peace and they want justice. Uh, you know, this is a long battle of head. Uh, what is going to transpire? Uh, we just want to make sure they just want to make sure that, you know, justice is served because many times they see has happened many times where uh, incidents like this happen where an officer gets arrested uh, and gets fired, um, but there's no conviction in terms of jail time mm -hmm. uh, that actually transpires. So this is a long road ahead for them. So they have been in prayer and they have been really trying to be able to keep the peace in terms of allowing the right, right. people across this country to continue to protest peacefully. And, and what are your thoughts on the protest? Because I think that um, in my mind, and I think a lot of people's minds, they would consider uh, George Floyd's death a pivotal moment in this country, in the history of this country, because a lot of things are changing as a result of that. First, I want to talk about your thoughts about the protests that have taken place all around the world uh, and, and, and how you plan on continuing to keep that fight going. Well, I mean, I've never seen nothing like this before, but I, I kind of knew that it was going to happen uh, in terms of protesting because we have been in the house for the last three months uh, and uh, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, and we experienced the Black and African-American community, Latino community, have experienced so many deaths and had the high rates of health disparities in our communities. Uh, and we... Uh, on, and we were trying to be able to fight that with our left hand. And then on our right hand, we had to be able to experience uh, NYPD uh, enforcement on social distancing and um, to add insult to injury, we had to experience George Floyd. So it was a powder keg waiting to explode. And that's what it did. It exploded to where not only just black people, but white people decided to say, no, listen, Black Lives Matter, and until Black Lives Matter, then all lives would matter. And it striked the movement uh, across this country. We're not just here in the USA, but in London, in Germany, in Australia, across this country, in Spain, uh, people of, in Paris, and people are just really saying no justice, no peace, and Black Lives Matter. And people are saying that, you know, they want peace on the left and justice on the right. So it's really a movement that is striking because it was the power that people that would allow laws and things to be changed and statues to be moved and names to be taken down because it was the power of the people. We send folks that it's a strategy that we folks use and that we use to be able to get the results. It's from demonstration to legislation. And we demonstrate to be able to get their attention but we send legislators to legislate the legislation and get laws to create, and then legislation turns into policy and procedures to be changed. Mm -hmm. And that's what people did, and that's what people are, are you're seeing uh, all over the country. The chokehold bill here in New York, uh, you're seeing uh, people are talking about defunding the police department uh, uh, all over the country. You're talking about institutions who have connections uh, with uh, local police departments where they are now saying they're cutting all ties of the police department. So it's really a national movement that's that's happening. You're talking about stuff happening in a matter of weeks where we was waiting for bills and legislation we passed for years. Uh, so this is a time where, you know, yes, we've been fighting for 400 years and everything we had to be able to fight for, uh, but this is a time where we're actually getting the results and because of the power of the people and people are rising up like they never rose up before. Interesting. And I do want to say that I, I, I always ask people, activists like yourself, um, about what they think, you know, um, I'm seeing on television, I've been to a couple of rallies myself, I'm seeing a lot of white people that I haven't seen before at these events that are that are joining uh, black people and all people of all colors in the streets about this. What do you think kind of turned the light on for, for a lot of white folks to just be a part of it? Well, you know, white people have always been a part of our movement. I mean, back in the 60s, you had white folks a part of 
the movement with Martin Luther King, uh, and they was doing things uh, back then with our lives because that's what Martin Luther King believed in, and that's the tradition that you know I follow and others follow. So we're not uh, against white folks, and they're not. We we welcome them into the movement, and we're glad they're marching and speaking up. But they have to understand that this is about black folks, and we want you to be able to join our issue, not try to take over our issue. Because we experienced this stuff more than ever. We went through 400 years of child slavery. We went through Jim Crowism. We went through uh, police mis- brutality across the country. So we're thankful for that, that they understand that our lives matter in terms of black lives. But it's about us now for this particular movement. And we can be able to do it. So uh, we can't talk about other stuff until we deal with the black lives that have been affected by this wholeheartedly and so for so many years. So it's great that they're joining. It's great that they're marching, but just understand that you're marching behind us and with us, not before us. Interesting. And I also want to know from you, what are your thoughts on a lot of the corporations and companies are now changing a lot of things? We're seeing, you know, when you go to any website pretty much now, uh, you see Black Lives Matter and you see a company supporting that. You're seeing uh, monuments being torn down. What are your thoughts on corporate America now kind of also waking up to uh, to the movement of Black Lives Matter and, and being more sensitive to race relations? Uh, I'm thankful of that uh, it was the power of the people that really strike this movement so you had to you had to be in it to be a part of the conversation and corporations benefit from black america from latino america so they have to be able to respond in saying they support the black lives matter movement and not just saying supporting by uh putting it on your website but supporting it financially supporting with it also on your staff Um, And not just uh, tearing down monuments and making uh, corporations change their names, but really understanding the movement behind it and not just doing things for publicity or publicity stunts, but really having the action behind what you're doing to be able to get people to understand that, yes, I believe in the movement and not just believe in the moment. So it's good to be able to remove the statues, um, but we would need to be able to remove the statues paint Black Lives Matter, change street names, but we don't just need symbolism. We need the change that's going to happen with the symbolism because if it's not in the heart and the mind, if it's in the heart and the mind of the people, then the symbolism means nothing. So they have to change the mindset of systemic cultural racism, then that means something because if you, you can have 100 employees and all of them can be white and, uh, and some are black, and the cultural systemic racism uh, is inside the it deep embedded in terms of the philosophy and you're not allowing and hiring black people. And you're not just, if you're saying black lives matter, but you really don't mean it, then you can keep the statues. You can keep the, uh, the mantras. We don't need mantras. We need action and we need to be able to change the mindset in the hearts of the people to understand that really black lives matter. And I really mean it, not just black a mantra. And we also are seeing that this movement is having an impact on politics as well. We just had the New York primary uh, this week, and we saw the election of Jamal Bowman, who in the Bronx, in his congressional race, beat out a very longtime white opponent, white incumbent. Uh, and we also saw uh, Richie Torres, who was a young uh, Afro-Latino, who uh, beat out several candidates who had been in politics for many years and also we're on the horizon of getting a, a black Queensboro president with the election of uh of city council member uh, donovan richards do you think that that this movement is having a an impact on politics and will it will it will extend uh to november because i think that's what a lot of people are looking to do you think this will extend to the general election yes this is a movement i mean i'm so excited that people actually turned their protest into voting and they have voted with their conscience, voted with their messaging. They say, hey, Black Lives Matter. I marched for 18 days, but I'm actually going to march to the polls on Election Day and change the narrative and put someone in office that looks like me, that believes in me, and that has the same mindset as me in terms of my Black and Latino life. So it's great to be able to see individuals like Jamal Bowman, who come from the Bronx, who come from 
you know, the, the, you know, who grew up in a single parent home, who was stopped by the police, who experienced it now is in Congress. It's good to hear that in Queens, you have the first black borough president that's going to happen because you have somebody that came up the ranks from Queens, from Far Rockaway. So it's good to hear that actually people are actually going out to vote. You're seeing changes happen gradually and it's happened. Change. We just want to make sure that it happens on in September and in November in the uh, in the general election when we could be able to vote Trump out of office and really say that 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 is the momentum that we must continue to build up until the general election. And here in New York, we have to be able to deal with stuff that's happening here in New York. We don't need elected officials that be progressive with words, but don't don't say nothing with action. Here it is. We have a governor here in New York that talk about, you know, he's progressive and talk about he's going to do all these things. And, you know, he stands with the Black Lives Matter protest, talking about we won. We didn't win. You know why we didn't win? Because the same governor that's talking about Black Lives Matter, he needs to deal with, and we're going to be moving on it very shortly, he needs to deal with right in Albany, Josh, right in Albany, in the Rotunda, mm -hmm. there is a mural of a Confederate flag in the middle of the Capitol. Mm -hmm. Right in the, is another mural with a horse on a Confederate flag right in the Capitol. So the governor needs to be able to address this and he should not just talk about the be of action of words, but understand that this is about black lives and he cannot play with our black lives by anything. You can sign legislation uh which has been on your desk it's not something that just happened because of uh, George Floyd in the mm -hmm. movement, but this is on his desk. It was on his desk. We were fighting for this. He pulled a 50. So he needs to deal with that mural and that racist mural that's on the top of the Capitol Rotunda that comes from races and reminding of people every time we walk into that Rotunda to see that. So we are calling on the governor to take that down and to paint over it before the session, before the end of the session. Mm, okay. And speaking of the governor, he did sign a series of reforms, police reforms, and one of those reforms uh, was to ban uh, the chokehold by the by all police officers in the state. And you, uh, you, we saw recently that a police officer, days after this was signed, a police officer in Queens was caught on video putting a citizen in a chokehold. And you actually held a press conference about that this week, and you're actually holding one today. Is that correct? Tell us about your involvement with that and your thoughts on the situation. Yeah, so, yeah, this officer, first of all, what police officer in their right mind would do a chokehold on an individual? I called for him to be able to be fired and arrested. We thank the NYPD commissioner for moving into the step in the right direction and moving swiftly, something I've never seen before, never seen on the administration. And I commend publicly the NYPD commissioner, Dermot Shea, for getting rid of the anti-crime unit because that unit was responsible for the deaths of Eric Garner, responsible for the deaths of Saheed Vessel and Delron Small. So I agree that that unit should have been disinvolved. And it took Dermot Shea and his leadership to really move in the direction to disband that unit. Secondly, this officer in uh, 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 David Fl uh, Flando, he was the one that had a history of this stuff, history of police misconduct, H had eight cases against him, Suit, uh, uh, civil suits against him, and he's still on the force. So I call for publicly that he should be arrested and fired, and if he wasn't going to be done by Friday, we were going to turn up the temperature and we were going to protest and rally. And to my demise today, that, to my surprise today, he's being arrested, uh, and he's making sure that this, the Queen's District Attorney is making sure that this is a precedent that she's setting in terms of she's not tolerating police officers just getting rid of way with murder. Because don't make no sense to having these laws in place, Josh, if we can't get the laws turned into reality. We can have a law, but make sure the law turns into reality. If you ban a turkhole who has been banned since 1981, and if, you, if it's illegal now, then why is the cop not fired? He shouldn't just be suspended. He should be fired. And why is he not arrested? When you do something illegal, you get arrested for because you did something illegal. Mm -hmm. So we're thankful for the Queens District Attorney, Melinda Katz, who is showing us that she's not like previous administrations, 
where she's actually moving swiftly and very uh, 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 confident in terms of receiving justice. Now we want to make sure that this officer receives some jail time. That's when I think that was set a precedence in New York City in terms of building the trust back into the police department by when an officer is perp walked. Don't you know, Josh, that the only cases, that all these cases, you've been around for a long time, out of all these cases yeah. that you hear from Sean Bell, from mm -hmm. Eric Garner, uh, even going back to Amadou Diallo, mm -hmm. out of all these cases, there's only one case where an officer is still in jail. And that's Abner the Weaver. And yeah. that's Peter Vopley. He's been spending 30 years in jail. He don't get out at all until he's in the end of his sentence. So this is something that we have to send precedence when an officer has to go to jail. And that's what makes a difference in terms of building the trust back into the police department, defunding the police department, and making sure that those billions of dollars that they have at least give us one billion so we can deal with the youth, we can deal with the education, we can deal with the service. People talk about black on black crime, but right. you're going to have crime because we don't have resources. Mm -hmm. So when you don't have resources, you look at it. We went through COVID. So you have a mother that lost her job through COVID, a father that lost her job through COVID, and then you got the mayor cut some of youth programs and say that there's no be no some youth job. So what you going to have? You're going to have crime. My mother used to always say, I don't mind, it's a devil's workshop. But it's a devil's workshop because the mayor and the governor is not supporting the efforts of defunding the police department and making sure that you can have some adequate resources to go put that money where their mouth is. The city council is supporting it, which is great, but we want to make sure. So there's an Occupy City Hall right now to make sure that they do what they say before the budget is done. And my last question for you is, you know, we're seeing this momentum uh, going. Um, I'm going to be honest. I'm starting to see just every day I'm seeing less, not less, but the, the coverage is starting to light up, lighten up a little bit uh, because this is an important issue uh, that needs to keep going. Uh, what, what are the next steps moving forward with everything that's going on, with the police getting arrested, with the companies doing what they're doing, the monuments coming down, uh, and hopefully we're going to get justice. But what, what are the next steps here? The next step is, is that we have to be able to make sure that Congress deals with legislation that means and looks like us. We don't need no watered-down version. We don't need Tim Scott and the Republicans to be able to do issues about us. We need to make sure that legislation looks like us and it means real legislation. We say no to the Justice Act. We don't need that stuff. We need real policy we need real legislation we need real stuff that looks tangible because after this is not a moment it's a movement i've been doing this for the last 17 years of my life and because of me doing it is the power of the people that makes the difference so we are continue to fight even when people get back to their daily lives we're going to continue to be out there. We're going to continue to keep the pressure on because this is injustices that happen. And until you change the sense of people of understanding real black lives, not real understanding the culture and getting and embedding out the culture and the cancer that's in the police departments and in institutions, that's in legislator uh, and the legislator. Uh, until we do that, then our job is never complete. So we still got more work to do. Uh, and it's good. You know, I stood with the mayor when we signed Black Lives Matter uh, in front of the justices uh, 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 in, in New York City uh, in, the, in the five bells. And I stand with him. But I need that to be able to look like reality. I don't just need him to be able to paint it. I need it to act it. And that's what we uh, we got uh, statues that's in City Hall. You got Thomas Jefferson that's been there in the city council. The mayor's wife did a commission. We want that. We want Thomas Jefferson out of there. So this is a fight that we have to continue to stay on and continue to be on even after the cameras and the lights are off. All right, Reverend McCall, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. That concludes this week's podcast. You can pick up the latest edition of the New York Amsterdam News on newsstands and get updates online at amsterdamnews.com. You can also keep up with us on Facebook at NY Amsterdam News and follow us on Twitter at NY Am News. I'm Cyril Josh Barker. Thanks for listening. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Eleanor Tatum, and I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of the New York Amsterdam News. The coronavirus crisis has brought serious distress to local economies and advertising along with them. The New York Amsterdam News has partnered with the local media association during this unprecedented crisis. Help us continue our important work in chronicling the life of black New Yorkers and consider making a donation to the COVID-19 local news fund today. Go to givebutter.com slash Amsterdam News. Again, that is G-I-V-E-B-U-T-T-E-R dot com slash Amsterdam News. Thank you and stay safe.